Welcome. In the past three videos, we examined the first phase of Operation Barbarossa. If you have watched those videos, you would know that the situation was not good for the Soviets at this point. In this video, we will examine a crucial battle that took place in the city of Smolensk. This city is extremely important for both sides because Smolensk is right on the path to Moscow, which is obviously the final German objective for Operation Barbarossa. Quick fact, Napoleon also passed through Smolensk in his invasion of Russia. During this battle, a decision was made by Hitler himself that would dramatically change the future of this war. More on that later. Let's take a look at the strategic map. The last three battles have resulted in substantial gains for Nazi Germany. At this point, the German spearheads are almost halfway to Moscow. Taking Smolensk would fall on the shoulders of Army Group Center, commanded by Field Marshal Feder von Bock. The plan was to have the 2nd Panzer Army pushed on Smolensk from the south, while the 3rd Panzer Army pushed in from the north, with infantry divisions following closely behind, creating a cauldron that was so successful in the Battle of Bielostok Minsk. Let's take a look at the numbers. From the 3rd Panzer Army, commanded by Colonel General Hermann Hoth, we have the 7th, 20th, and 12th Panzer Divisions along with the 20th and 18th Motorized Infantry Divisions. The larger 2nd Panzer Army, commanded by Colonel General Heinz Guderian, would be split into two groups. The first group is composed of the 17th, 18th, and 10th Panzer Divisions, along with the 29th Motorized Infantry Division, the SS Das Reich Motorized Division, and the Elite Infantry Regiment Gross Deutschland, who has one of the classiest insignias I've ever seen. The second group is composed of the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions, along with the 10th Motorized Division and the 1st Cavalry Division. Later on, a total of 12 infantry divisions from the 9th and 4th infantry armies would join this fight. On the Soviet side, General Semyon Timoshenko was appointed as the new commander of the Soviet Western Front. He commands the remnants of the armies destroyed in the Battle of Bielostok Minsk, majority of them from the 13th Army. There was also the 20th, 22nd, 19th, and 16th Army fresh from the reserves. Most of them are not fully assembled at this point. Five additional Soviet armies would later join this fight as reinforcements. The Germans had about 450,000 men participating in this entire battle, along with about 1,000 tanks and 1,500 aircraft. The Soviets had a total of upwards of a million men participate throughout this battle. They still outnumber the Germans in tanks, but not by much, with 1,500 tanks. There was very little Soviet air activity as the Luftwaffe still had air supremacy at this stage of the war. Let's look at the map. By July 10th, the Germans have pushed all the way up to the Dnieper and Davina rivers. The units from the 3rd Panzer Army was placed at the top. The first group from the 2nd Panzer Army was placed in the middle and the other group placed at the bottom. The German infantry have yet to arrive and are still marching to the front. The Soviets had various units from different armies scattered across the front lines. The Soviet defense at this point was very disorganized and certainly not ready for another German attack. Keep in mind that there was also fierce fighting happening to the north and south of the map you're looking at now, but I am only covering the epicenter of the battle. On July 10th, the battle begins. Up top, Hermann Hoth's 2nd Panzer Army pushes forward. The 7th and 20th Panzer Divisions act as spearheads while the 18th Motorized cover the northern approach and the 20th Motorized and 12th Panzer cover their southern flank. The Soviet units were easily pushed back. At the same time, Guderian's 1st Panzer Group surged forward, crossing the Dnieper River and easily pushed past the weak Soviet defenses. Guderian's thrust created a huge opening in the Soviet lines. At the same time, Guderian's second group pushes forward as well. In this attack, the Soviet 20th Mechanized Corps and the 61st Infantry Corps were suddenly trapped in a small pocket slightly east of Mogilev. German infantry divisions are now catching up and joining the fight, two of them marching to the north, another four marching to the south. Soviet reinforcements are arriving as well. Two infantry corps are moving to defend the German pincer in the north, while an infantry corps, a motorized corps, and also an airborne corps 
were moving to meet the Germans in the south. The day is now July 13th, and as you can see, gaps are being created by the spearheads of the Panzer armies. I want to reiterate the importance of tanks and warfare of this era. This is why Germany was so successful in the early stages of World War II. They would easily create gaps in the enemy defense with a devastating attack combining tanks, motorized infantry, and aircraft. Then the infantry catches up and begin mopping up the shocked and scattered enemy troops. This is exactly what happened in France and at the Battle of Bielostok Minsk and it seems to be happening again. The battle continues. Up top, the 18th Motorized pushes back the Soviet 20th Infantry Corps. The 7th and 20th Panzer Divisions waste no time by bypassing the Soviet infantry below them and were able to push all the way to Yard Sevel. The 12th Tank and 20th Motorized follow their advance and cover the southern flank. In the middle of the map, the 18th and 29th Motorized Divisions stream their tanks deep into Soviet territory with little opposition. The 17th Panzer cover their northern approach while the 10th and SS Das Reich Divisions cover their southern approach. Down at the bottom, the German units continue pushing back the Soviet 45th Infantry Corps. The Grossduschlin Regiment and the 10th Motorized stay behind to engage the 20th Motorized and 61st Infantry Corps. These two surrounded Soviet Corps were ordered to hold and defend their positions despite being completely surrounded and cut off. Multiple counterattacks were made by Soviet troops to stem the German onslaught. These counterattacks include the three fresh Soviet Corps at the bottom and the Soviet units west of Smolensk. These counterattacks all fail and the Soviets are pretty much trading their men's lives to buy time. The German and Soviet infantry corps in the back continues their march to the front lines. The German 34th Infantry Division begins engaging the two trapped Soviet corps. Eight fresh German divisions arrive at the scene of the battle, three in the north, five in the south. Huge numbers of Soviet reinforcements arrived as well. Soviet defense in this sector was organized into four main groups, named after their commanders. Group Komenko was stationed to the north and had four infantry divisions and two cavalry divisions. Some of their units operated north of this map. Group Kalinin, positioned slightly below Komenko, had four rifle divisions. Group Rokossovsky was positioned directly at the mouth of the cauldron with one infantry division and two tank divisions. Group Kachalov, with two rifle divisions and one tank division, was positioned to the north. Each group had 40,000 to 60,000 men. More and more Soviet reinforcements will arrive in the upcoming weeks. The day is now July 16th. I think it is evident what is happening. Five Soviet corps are dangerously close to being surrounded north of the Dnieper River by the German Panzer spearheads. The Soviets need to buy time to stabilize their shattered front lines, but the Germans obviously won't let that happen so easily since the whole point of Blitzkrieg is to shatter the initial enemy defense and prevent the enemy from re-establishing their defense. The battle rages on. Up top, the 18th Motorized has drove the Soviet 20th Corps off the map and turns east to join his friends. The 7th and 20th Panzer Divisions were bogged down by swampy terrain along with stubborn Russian resistance. They were not able to make much progress in these few days. The 12th Panzer and 20th Motorized Divisions move eastwards as the 5th and 35th Infantry Divisions take up their former positions. In the middle of the map, Guderian decided to establish a bridgehead at Yelnia and orders the 10th Panzer Division and SS Das Reich Divisions to perform the task. The 18th Panzer Division was diverted to cover their southern approach. The 29th Motorized and 17th Tank Divisions began their attack on Smolensk and engaged in a week of bloody street fighting with the Soviet defenders inside the city. The Soviet units in the cauldron are now trying to fight their way out. Thanks to reinforcements, the line is held for now. About four German infantry divisions are now fully engaged with the remaining Soviet defenders east of Mogilev, who put up a stubborn defense, while the rest of them march forward quickly to join the main battle at Smolensk. The four Soviet groups continued forward and attempt to re-establish their front lines. On July 19th, as battle raged in and around Smolensk, Hitler sent out a Führer directive which would dramatically change the course of the war and maybe even modern history as we know it. It stated that after the Soviet resistance at Smolensk was liquidated, 
Hermann Hoth and his 3rd Pencil Army would move north to support the attack on Leningrad, while Heinz Guderian's 2nd Pencil Army would move south to support Army Group South in destroying the Soviet Southwestern Front. Do you guys see what Hitler just did? This was the infamous decision Hitler made to stop the advance towards Moscow, but rather focus on destroying Red Army units. Now we can debate all day long on whether or not this decision was the reason Germany lost the war, but two things were certain. First, the mass majority of German commanders were shocked and disagreed with Hitler's decision. So much so that the three main German commanders of Army Group North, Bock, Hoth, and Guderian, conspired together to try to delay the implementation of this plan for as long as possible. The second thing that was certain was that taking Moscow will have to wait. Back to the map. The day is now July 22nd. The Soviets are in a desperate situation with hundreds of thousands of men trapped in a big pocket north of Smolensk. Soviet reinforcements have already launched wave after wave of counterattacks all over the front. Despite being overstretched, outnumbered, and tired after days of endless fighting, the German Panzer and motorized infantry spearheads hold their position while trying to link up east of Smolensk. The German spearheads are probably outnumbered 5 to 1 right now, but keep in mind that the German soldiers are professionally trained and battle-toughened soldiers while the Soviet troops were probably poor farmers, forcibly pulled off their land, given one and a half week of basic training, and carelessly thrown into the sights of German machine guns and tanks. The Russian soldiers at this point were poorly trained, poorly organized, and poorly equipped. Their morale was probably very low as well. The Germans also had complete air superiority and that helped tremendously in driving back the numerous Soviet counterattacks. Rokossovsky was ordered to hold the gap open and he managed to hold against the German pencils for now and some Soviet troops from inside the cauldron are able to escape. However, the gap opening is being squeezed tighter and tighter by German units from both sides. Fighting continued in the south, with neither side gaining too much ground. The Soviet forces trapped at Mogilev have been liquidated at this point. More than 35,000 Soviet troops were captured here. Guderian's second army has managed to push all the way to Yaunia, taking this position and established his bridgehead. However, this position was not a great defensive position and the Soviets would eventually take it back a month later while inflicting heavy casualties on the Germans. German infantry kept moving forward. A few of them moved south of the map. By July 27th, the German Panzer armies have finally closed the gap, sealing big portions of the Soviet 16th, 19th, and 20th armies inside. Counterattack attempts were launched to recreate the gap, and the Soviets did manage to create small gaps in the German lines for a while, which allowed some troops to escape. However, by July 30th, the gap was permanently sealed. The main battle was over. Skirmishes would continue between the two sides, especially around the Yaunia salient. The Soviets took massive casualties. 186,000 were killed in action, 300,000 were captured, and 274,000 were wounded. Keep in mind that more than 50% of captured Soviet soldiers died in POW camps, and many Soviet wounded were left behind. Upwards of 400,000 to 500,000 Soviet men wouldn't live to tell their tales. I couldn't find any source on the amount of German casualties for this battle, but from my estimations, they probably took upwards of 50,000 to 75,000 casualties in total. The Germans would take 23,000 casualties later, defending the Yaunia salient. Let's analyze this battle. It was definitely a German tactical victory, as they have yet again destroyed a sizable portion of the Red Army. However, they're now understanding that the Soviets had two things. One, a disregard for their men's lives. Two, a lot of men. The Soviets can lose hundreds of thousands of soldiers, but reform their army in the matter of weeks. This battle also resulted in a major decision by Hitler to stop the drive on Moscow, but rather head north and south. The Battle of Smolensk has shown that the war in the east will not be the decisive victory that Hitler was looking for, but a bloody war where millions of men will be used to slaughter one another. The German soldiers, who expected to get home before Christmas, will face the same fate as their counterparts in 1914. The same suffering awaits Soviet men, forcibly conscripted into the Red Army, 
and thrown carelessly into the front lines by commanders who cared little whether they lived or died. The Battle of Smolensk wasn't the beginning of the end, it was simply the warm-up stage of one of the most brutal periods of human history.